We are starting a new series this morning, and we're going to be talking about names. Okay, names. What exactly is a name? If I asked you to describe the definition of name, how would you describe that? My guess is that you might say something to the effect of a name would be a series of sounds that we put together to form a word that identifies a specific person, right? My name is Joseph, or Joe, or Pastor Joe, right? I have several different names that people refer to me, but a name is simply that, right? In our world, in our culture today that we live in, names are just that. They are words that we express to identify someone specific. In fact, I I Googled as I was studying for this, 2022 weird names. Okay, these are actual names of people that were chosen in 2022. The first one I wrote down was Windy. Like it's windy outside. I thought that was neat. My grandfather, whose name is actually James, uh, his nickname was Windy. But his, his actual given name was James. But Wendy was an actual name. Vin Nilla. Vin Nilla. Velvet. Starlet. Snowdrop. And even Panda. Panda showed up as an actual name given to somebody this year. I was reminded of, uh, while we lived in Maryland, some friends of ours knew people named Orangelo in Lamangelo, and they were actually spelled orange jello and lemon jello. And these are actual names. Right? I was reminded, in fact, athletes and, and celebrities are not even immune to this. I was reminded of uh, an NFL player by the name of Chad Johnson. And maybe you know him by that name. Some of you I see nodding. Uh, he was a wide receiver who most notably played for the Cincinnati Bengals. He played for the Patriots and a few other teams, but he was number 85. He changed his legal last name to Ocho Cinco, which is Spanish for 8-5. Right, so in today's culture, it seems that not much goes into naming a child or someone's name other than something interesting, something neat, unique maybe, something cool something that I don't mind calling my child for the rest of their life. However, I will say that names are still very important, and they're still very potent. As an example, you don't hear many people by the name of Benedict Arnold or Adolf Hitler, right? We stay away from those names because of the connotation that comes with them. And in biblical times, it was no different, whether it was the New Testament, but especially in the Old Testament, We see that names are very important. In fact, names weren't just uh, nomenclature or how you referred to someone, but names actually helped to identify something very specific about that person. A person's name carried great meaning, great value. A person's name revealed important information about them. Names were important. In fact, there were several instances in Scripture in which God changed someone's name to reveal a new truth about that individual. As an example, Abram. Abram, by definition, meant exalted father. Well, God promised Abram that he would be the father of a great nation and changed his name to Abraham, which means father of a multitude. Jacob, by definition, Jacob means grabber of the heel or uh, deceitful. God changed Jacob's name to Israel, which means one who prevailed. We even see this in the New Testament. We don't often use the name Simon, but Simon's brother brought Simon to see Jesus. And in John 1, 42, Jesus, it says, looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John, you shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. Peter, by definition in the Greek, means the rock. 
In Scripture, a name conveys purpose, it conveys authority, it conveys makeup, even character. Right? It's more than just sounds that we put together to identify a specific person. In fact, name by word appears over a thousand times throughout the New and Old Testament. So the question is, why does this matter to us? Right? We're talking about it. Why is it important to, to you and me? We see our God has such depth to his character that it is frankly impossible for us to fully comprehend God himself. But God reveals specific character attributes about himself and about how he relates to humanity through his various names. I mean, perhaps you know some of God's more popular names. Elohim, Adonai, El Shaddai. Emmanuel, Jehovah. But again, these names and many more names that refer to God don't simply refer to God, but the names very specifically reveal to you and me and reveal to humanity very specific qualities and attributes about God. God's names are like the key by which we open the character qualities about God, how we better understand who God is and the treasures that God has in store for you and me. Every situation that we go through in life, every mountaintop of praise that we find ourselves in, every valley, every low, every difficult and trying circumstance that we find ourselves in in life, God has a specific name for each and every circumstance that we find ourselves in. And those names speak to our circumstances and they speak to the promises that God has in store for you and for me. I would argue that you cannot truly understand God if you do not understand his names. That being the case, over the next several weeks, we are going to start a series in which we look at God's names and what they mean to you and me, how they speak to us. This morning, we will actually start with the first name that God reveals to us in Scripture. Next week, Christmas, we are going to look at the last name that God reveals to us in Scripture of himself, that being Emmanuel. So if you ever find yourself wondering, right, who is God? Who exactly is this God that we serve in this series, although it will only scratch the surface of who God is, will hopefully, through learning God's names and what they mean, what they mean to us, will give us a better understanding of God. That being said, I am using a book to help guide myself in my studies. The book was written by Pastor Tony Evans. I don't know if you're familiar with Tony Evans, but... Uh, in his book, The Power of God Names. And, and as I'm reading the book, there's a specific section of text as I started reading in the introduction that really spoke to me. And I wanted to share that with you this morning. Pastor Evans says, Friend, if you believe you have it all together, or if you think highly of your success or your human achievements, by the time you finish this book, you may be able to pronounce God's names, but you're not likely to experience the power of his names in your life. The majesty of God is reserved for those who know enough to know that they don't know much of anything at all. To know God's names is to experience his nature, and that level of intimacy is reserved for those who humbly depend on him. He goes on to say that you cannot know God's names until you have forgotten your own. With that in mind, we're going to begin our study. And I want to start uh, briefly by pointing out something from Matthew 6. Okay, we're going to be in Matthew 6 very briefly here. If you're familiar with that text, this is Jesus teaching his disciples how to pray. The disciples notice there's something different about Jesus and the way that he prays. They ask Jesus, teach us 
how to pray. And Jesus does that, and he begins the prayer. This is the Lord's Prayer that we're all familiar with. And he says, pray then like this. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Hallowed is a Greek word. It means separate. It means pure. It means set apart, holy, consecrated. As we begin, I will point out the fact that God's names, again, are not just names that refer to God. God's names carry weight. He is the one true God of heaven and of earth, and we must treat him accordingly. God's names are holy. In fact, we see the opposite of that in the Old Testament, Exodus, of Israel out of Egypt. And if you remember, Israel left Egypt, and while they were in the desert, Moses went on to Mount Sinai and received the Ten Commandments, right? These were the ten rules that God said, follow these rules. And in Exodus 20, verse 7, you're familiar with this, it says, you shall not take the Lord your God's name in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Okay, now, if I'm honest, I lived a lot of my life when I was younger thinking that this meant curse words, right? Don't take the Lord's name in vain, meant don't curse and use God's name when you're cursing. By definition here, though, vain means empty. It means vanity, it means falsehood. Taking God's name in vain does not simply mean using God's name when you curse or in a string of obscenities. It refers to the idea of using God's name without meaning. Right? Using God's name in a manner that is inconsistent with his character. Now, people will often invoke God's name without having the personal relationship with God. You know, how often do we hear people say something like, I swear to God. There's no relationship there with God, and yet they are invoking God's name. How many events have you ever been to in which we will use God's name as a part of an invocation and part of a benediction, but we leave God out of everything that happens in between? When God is not valued or understood, or appreciated even for who he really is, then using his name, it's a lot like trying to leverage God and his power and his identity for our own purposes. It's like saying, you know what, I want all the best that God has to offer, but I don't care enough to obey and to follow him. Pastor Evans says that to take God's name in vain is to define God by our own wishes and desires, rather to know him as he defines himself. That is our goal for this study, is to understand that as we study God's names, these are not merely words by which we refer to God in different languages or in different contexts, but rather God's names are the tool by which we can leverage, rather, using God's names are not a tool that we use to leverage God to do bidding for us. Right? We don't leverage God's names in difficult times or in times of need. Call on God through his names, and then when everything's going great, we take care of it ourselves. God's names reveal to you and to me who God truly is. Is. So with that in mind, and with the time that we have left, we are going to take a look at the first name that God reveals to us in Scripture. And I will say, and I probably repeat myself multiple times this morning, but in a lot of what we are studying this morning, it is incredibly difficult for you and me to comprehend and to try and understand. So please keep that in mind as we study these Truths. We start in Genesis 1, 1, right? This is the beginning. This is Moses 
and his account of creation itself. Genesis 1.1 says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now this name for God is the Hebrew name Elohim. Elohim, from what we learn from this text, is creator. Right? God is not a part of his creation. He is above it. He lives outside of it. Elohim created the heavens and the earth. And there are a lot of agnostic views that would suggest that God is in the world. Right? God is in the trees, and the trees are God, and, and the grass and the animals, and God is everywhere in the world. And I would argue that God is, in fact, reflected in those things. When you create something, part of you is reflected in that creation. So, yes, our world reflects God, but God is not the trees. God is not the animals. God is not nature. God created those things, and as the creator of those things, God lives above them and outside of them. The text says, in the beginning, God, which means not only did Elohim create the heavens and the earth, but he created time itself. Elohim created the beginning. He created the timeline that you and I live on. And again, I will admit that for us to attempt to understand this in full, it's going to make your brain hurt. We, I think, I think we understand the idea of eternity, right? Especially as Jesus followers, we understand we were born, we have accepted forgiveness in Jesus, and we will live for eternity with God in heaven. We understand the idea of eternity, but eternity with the beginning. Something began and it will be around forever. But Elohim didn't have a beginning. Our God has always been and always will be. He has always existed. He created the beginning. God has no end. And he has no beginning. He has no past. And he has no future to God every moment is the present. Every moment is right now. Again, I wouldn't wear yourself out trying to understand that too much because everything in our world has a lifespan, right? Everything exists for a period of time. It bore, it's born and then it dies. It, it has a life cycle. So it's difficult for us to understand this. But Elohim, our God, always was, always has been, and always Ways will be, and perhaps in heaven, we may understand this concept a little better, but the truth of the matter is, Elohim transcends time. He created time, so he lives outside of time. Not only is he creator, but he is all-powerful. Elohim, there is nothing that he cannot do, and of course we have to apply logic to that. You cannot say or ask the question, can God create a rock so big that God cannot pick it up? Right? Well, that's illogical. God is, however, all powerful. Genesis 18, when we're talking about Abram, and Abram questioned God as to whether or not he'd be able to have a child so late in his life. And God's response was, is anything too difficult for the Lord? Right In Luke 1, what we celebrate next week, when Mary found out that even though she was a virgin, she was pregnant. And she questioned the angel and said, is this possible? And the angel's response was, nothing will be impossible with God. The name Elohim actually translates strong one. And when you look at the creation of our world, he is the strong one. Elohim literally took nothing and created the heavens and the earth. It reminded me of this funny little story about a scientist who was convinced that he could create a better version of man than God. So the scientist challenged God to see who could create 
the better version of man and God indulged. And he allowed the scientist to go first. So the scientist pulled his sleeves up and started to pull together some dirt from the ground. And God said, I don't think so. Create your own dirt first. (laughs) It's a funny little story, but it proves the point. Our God, Elohim, is all powerful. And he literally created this world that we live in from nothing. Elohim is the strong one who transcends time, but he also transcends space. Okay, it says, in the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. So before God could create mankind, he had to create a space in which mankind would live. Right? God created that space, the heavens and the earth. And we are familiar with these because we live on the earth. We understand the earth. We know the earth. Often we refer to the heavens as outer space, right? We don't know where exactly the heavens are, but we have space and outer space. We have the earth and heaven. We understand that. However, our God lives outside of that space, right? He lives in a in another dimension, so to speak, that we're not aware of, we don't understand, which is why it is so difficult for us to truly understand God because we don't experience the place where God is. God created the very matter of this world. And he's not only, not only does he live outside of time, but he lives outside of this world. He lives outside of matter itself, which means for you and me that our God, Elohim, is everywhere all the time. Because he lives outside of time and he lives outside of space, he is everywhere always. Jeremiah 23, 23, God asks Jeremiah, am I a God at hand, declares the Lord, and not a God far away? Can a man hide himself in secret spaces so that I cannot see him, declares the Lord? Do I not fill the heavens and the earth, declares the Lord? Now the fancy church word that we use for that is omnipresent, right? God is everywhere all the time. There's no place that we can go to hide ourselves from Again, these are difficult things for us to try and fully comprehend. Elohim is also plural. (coughs) Again, if you thought trying to understand God living outside the context of time and outside of the context of space was difficult, this is equally difficult, but our God (coughs) is plural. Elohim. The first time we see this in creation is in the creation of man. Genesis 1.26. It says that God then said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. So God created man in his own image and in the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. And if you pay attention, these two verses can be incredibly confusing. Because it says here, God said, let us, plural, make man in our, plural, image, in our, plural, likeness. But then you read verse 27, and it says that God, singular, created man in his, singular, image. In the image of God, he, singular, created him, male and female, he, singular, created him. Them. This is an incredibly difficult idea or concept to understand is that our God is a singular God that is plural in three parts. Again, we use the church word triune, which means God exists in three equal parts, Father, Son, and Spirit. And we see that in Matthew As Jesus is commissioning his disciples, you remember, he tells them to go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Spirit. Our God lives equally as Father, 
Son, and Spirit. And again, it's a difficult concept to try and understand and fully appreciate, but our God is plural, Elohim. Now, although Elohim lives outside of time and lives outside of space, our God is also a personal God. We see it in Genesis 3 as Elohim is walking through the garden, calling out to Adam and Eve. Right? He is the all-powerful creator, but he interacts with his creation. God is not some theory or some force or some concept that tries to explain the Big Bang Theory or evolution. He is creator, but he is personal. And so much of our world is relational because our God, the creator, is a relational God. Lastly, this morning, Elohim is the restorer. He's the restorer. You see, in Genesis 1, 1 and 2, it says that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And it says the earth was without form and void and darkness was over the face of the deep. You see, in the first verse of Genesis, God created time. He created the heavens and he created the earth. But if you read in verse 2, it says that the earth was void. It was dark. It was without form. And it's my belief that this is what happened when Satan was cast out of heaven. You see, Satan was cast out because he believed that he could be like God. And he could be as good as God. And he was cast out to the earth. And because of that, God's creation, the earth, became dark, void, a messed up place. One of the beauties of Elohim, if you keep reading through Genesis 1, it says that when the triune Elohim hovered over the surface of the earth, he spoke and he created light. And the light defeated the darkness and he spoke again and created land and the land separated the seas. He created fertile ground and he caused it to grow. Our God, Elohim, took a void, dark wasteland and he turned it into something beautiful. He redeemed it and brought about order. And that's the idea that we're going to end with this morning. When we talk about Elohim, I think one of the greatest lessons that you and I can learn and take from this name of God is exactly what we see from Genesis 1 and 2 through the rest of Genesis 1. Satan got involved and tried to screw up God's creation. But the all-powerful God of the universe, Elohim, would not allow it. Elohim can and did create something out of nothing. But he also took something that Satan tried to screw up, and he redeemed it. He restored it. He brought something beautiful out of Satan's mess. And you know the devil will do the same thing to you and me. The devil gets involved and gets in our mind and has us to believe things that aren't true. He will screw up our life. Sometimes it's the work of the devil, but if we're honest, sometimes it's our own sinfulness. It's our own uh, poor decision making. It's our own stupidity that brings about the mess that's in our life. But regardless of how our life got messed up, Elohim can and will restore your mess and turn it into something beautiful. All it takes is for us to call on his name. He is Elohim. He is the all-powerful creator of the universe. He is the triune God. He is everywhere all the time. 
calling on his name. And he will bring order and peace and beauty to your life. Father God, we are thankful for the truth that you reveal to us in your name alone. We acknowledge, God, that there are many aspects to your name that we just cannot fully comprehend. The idea that you are everywhere all the time, that you are all-powerful, that you have always been, that you always will be, that you exist in three parts, it's difficult for most of us to understand, but we follow you and we believe it in faith. That you are the all-powerful creator. God, we are thankful for that truth and how you not only created something from nothing, but God, how you also can restore our lives to something new. God, this morning we have many things that are on our minds and on our hearts. Many people experiencing loss, loved ones, family members. Many people experiencing cancer, cancer treatments. Many people that aren't with us this morning because they're ill or injury. Lord, we pray for each and every one of those. You know who they are. Your spirit knows their need. And we pray, God, for that this morning. God, as we celebrate the coming of our Savior, the Messiah, your Son, Jesus Christ, next week. I pray that that would be the focus, that would be the thing that our mind dwells on throughout the coming week, is your Son, Jesus, that we don't get caught up in the consumerism mentality of Christmas, Lord, but we focus on the gift of your Son, Jesus. God, we thank you for him, and we thank you for that gift this morning. I pray, God, that you would be with us as we leave this place, that we would be a light in a dark world, that you would guide each and every step we take. I thank you, God, and I praise you in the name of Jesus, our Savior.